I feel I was lied to in the same way that you're describing that doctors who were interested uh, in the contents of the vaccine and their durability in the cell were lied to because I was saying, I was repeating, oh, it's an mRNA. It's been encased in these lipid nanoparticles. The lipid nanoparticles have an affinity for cells because the cells have a lipid on their surface. That gives me some sort of a ballpark as a biologist to say, well, how novel is this, right? The lipid nanoparticles, highly novel. I can see that. The mRNA, it's highly novel in the sequence, but it's not highly novel to have an mRNA floating structure. in the yeah. cytoplasm. And so I have some sort of intuitive sense about what that would mean about how durable the thing would be. Because for one thing, the body doesn't like free mRNAs. Right? It doesn't like foreign nucleic acids. Right. It absolutely hates foreign nucleic acids. It's got all kinds of barriers for good reason. Right. So you would imagine. <laughs> so, And in fact, the story when the vaccines first came out. Um, was that one of the challenges was getting enough of the stuff intact into the cells to get it to work, right? So, okay, this all, this sets up in the mind a sense where the, the novel aspects that are introduced into the body are not long lived. So, yes, there's a lot of danger in this vaccine, but at least if you survive the period where it interacts with your cells. Which ostensibly is just a few hours. Right. So, at the point that I found out, oh, wait a minute. This isn't mRNA in the standard sense. My standard model for mRNA doesn't work. It doesn't tell right. me how long. It's as if you dropped a fiberglass log in the forest. And it's like, well, logs in the forest, they get eaten by termites and fungi and things like that. Interesting metaphor. I know how long that takes, roughly. Uh -huh. depends on the forest. But whatever, I've got some model. Well, that fiberglass log might last an awfully long time in that forest because it's not really a log at all. And... So anyway, I, I well, let's run with your metaphor for just a minute. All right. Okay, I love the metaphor. Okay, so because it's it has it has a length, two dimensional aspect, um, so that's that's good, um, and it's very long lived, and it's composed of fibers. I mean, we don't have to go too down in the metaphor. Yeah. Um, so the log in the forest, as the metaphor for the RNA, one of the things that has Ryan Cole and I really worried, and we've discussed how to do the experiment, but we're all too busy and it takes money. Um, okay. Now, imagine that log in the forest. Okay. Now we're going to place that log into the cell, metaphorically speaking. Okay. And that log has a function um, it processes something that causes something to be made that happens to be toxic. Okay. And yet the cell now, or the forest in the metaphor can never degrade it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that foreign thing that it makes can cause that cell to get attacked. Will cause it to get attacked. If, if you're successful in generating an immune response and a T cell response in particular, the cells that have that RNA that are making that spike protein will get attacked. So hold on. I want to pause you because I advanced a hypothesis on Dark Horse, which has now just come right back up. So I want to catch people up and then I want you to pick up your explanation. So what I argued, and I, I believe I came up with this independently, but I believe Peter McCullough has mentioned something similar as has Jonathan Cooey. The idea is the body has a way to recognize cells that have been virally infected. Yes. Cells that have been virally infected have a quirk, which is their surface has a mixture of self proteins, which the body recognizes and non self proteins, which it recognizes by virtue of the fact that it doesn't know what they are. When a cell has those two things on its surface, the only thing it can be from a biological perspective is a virally infected cell and a virally infected or cell. Or cancer cell. I guess it could be, well, yeah, because the, the then, same, then the, the non-self is self, but it's sufficiently it's a, it's changed. It's a mutated self. Right. Okay. So okay. fair enough. The point is, in either of those cases, there is one and only one right thing to do, and that is to destroy the cell, right? And the problem it's is- It's a simple switch. It's a simple <laughs> switch. If that cell is in your heart, well, you, now you've got two problems because you've got your immune True. system attacking the cells True. in the heart, and your heart- doesn't repair its scars. Bingo. Right. And so the point is, you could get a lot of scar tissue in your heart. You might get away with it. It might diminish the longevity of your heart. It might reduce its capacity to pump blood, or you might have just a little damage and you wouldn't be subthreshold. But All true. anyway, so the point is. Yeah, we could go down that rabbit hole if you want. We, with this 
uh, with the mRNA based vaccines, at least we set people who receive those injections up for their immune system to attack their own cells on the yes. basis that they had been virally infected. And then this issue of the change, the altered mRNA makes it vastly worse because the point is, it's not that the cell stops producing the foreign protein and maybe the immune system hasn't gotten around to killing it and that cell can go back to being a normal cell. The point is, now that mRNA might be very long lived and that cell is going to continue to produce foreign protein until some T cell, cytotoxic T cell comes and, and kills it out or a natural killer cell. Or antibody dependent cytotoxicity, cellular cytotoxicity. So all, all true. Yeah. Concur. Okay. And more so. So what that says is like what you want at the point that they say, all right, we've got a pandemic. We've got some vaccines. Don't worry. They're good vaccines. We've tested them. And you're trying to check whether or not what they're saying makes sense. The question is, how novel is that thing you want to inject into me, right? Lipid nanoparticles, mm, red flag, okay? That's, should be should have been well characterized pharmaceutically. Right, but there ain't no natural version of that, right? That is Correct. a non-targeted mechanism for invading cells. It's Correct. if, you know, it, it's dependent. In normal vaccinology, the characterization of the, uh, um, pharmacologic toxicology associated with that component. If, for instance, if we were to define it as an adjuvant, yeah, right, would typically require years. Mm -hmm. All right, so that was one red flag. That one set me off. Right, I could see that that was a hazard. It didn't mean it wasn't brilliant. I mean, I, I think it may in fact Doesn't be, matter. Well, but it is. It is what it is. It is what it is. But it's at least from the point of view of the more novel your uh, your remedy is, the more likely it has consequences you don't know about that you're not going to like. Right now, so add on top of that. So I missed that the payload also right. had a similar yes. level of yes. novelty here, yes. which was that the mRNA wasn't really mRNA. It was very special mRNA that might... I, I suggest it should not be called mRNA. It is a long-lived polynucleotide, single-stranded polynucleotide, which can be translated, but it is really not mRNA. I think it deserves its own language. Yeah, it, it certainly, it, it, it at least deserves another letter, Right. It deserves another letter, something that will call your attention to the fact that there's a novelty. SMRNA, synthetic mRNA or something. Right, something like that. And anyway, so at the point that you mentioned at the conference um, what this was, and it, the dime dropped that it wasn't that I had missed this at the beginning. It's that they, did, they forgot to mention it, right? And it's like a huge thing to forget to mention. I felt again burned by this whole story because with that piece of information, I could have been that much clearer about the novelty and the danger. And, you know, we, we could have had a better discussion, but. Um, so let me, let me, there's two corollaries. Yep. Um, uh, with this long lived RNA or synthetic polynucleotide, single stranded polynucleotide. Um, the, the, uh, the pharmacokinetics, the degradation of it, um, the clearance of it in your body is super important if one is interpreting the range of adverse events that are temporally, in other words, with time mm. associated with the administration of the drug. Okay, so we have been told, and it has been uh, the dogma, that, for instance, as you analyze bears or fill in the blank database, that we should really not focus on any adverse events, particularly things that look like acute adverse events as opposed to the delayed autoimmune things, um, but acute adverse events like um, myocardial damage um, that occur after about two weeks. Those are considered probably just background noise from whatever the physiology of the person was because it was assumed that the RNA only lasted a very brief period of time. Now we functionally have to go back, if, if we were being honest, if we were acting with integrity, scientific integrity, we would go back and say, oh, darn, we missed that. We need to go back and analyze the full profile of data and adverse events and recalculate the adverse event rate because we now know that this thing sticks around in your body for at least two months. So okay, there's that. This is part of the gaslighting, right? So, you, okay, 
the people who are still honest enough to try to interpret this and have the technical chops to understand what they're looking at, this was some kind of red herring. Because if you were trying to build a model, you've got all of these people who believe that they have had uh, injury yeah. from the vaccine. What is the injury? How plausible is it that it came from the vaccine? Well, if you don't know that the mRNA isn't mRNA and that it might be sticking around a very long time, right, then the point is those the likelihood that those those delayed reactions are the result of the vaccine skyrockets. Right. So if you didn't know that, then the point is you think, well, I don't it, know. it means that all of our prior interpretation about correlation between adverse events and and uh, the inoculation, I'm going to call it. I'm really trying to move away from calling these vaccines. Yep. They really no longer meet the criteria of vaccines. They're more like some sort of immunotherapeutic inoculation. We can, again, yep. the language matters. It does. Okay. Um, uh, and, and the term vaccine is clearly overly broad. Um, now I'm one, uh, uh, so we, we, we must, if we are acting with integrity, we must go back and reevaluate our prior assumptions and reevaluate the safety database in light of this cell paper, which by the way, they totally buried the lead. If you look at the title of that cell paper, you would never guess that it had this crucial data about the pharmacokinetics of the RNA or the relative levels of expression of the spike protein compared to uh, um, in the naturally infected in your circulating blood. Um, well, you would know it if you read the title. Surprise. Right. In fact, um, I, I didn't know this until I heard you mention it out loud and put the stuff together and it was so so now there's clear. another i said there's two branches to this yeah um you've 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 kind of mined the um uh implications in cellular immunology which we all knew um historically uh the other one is that's most worrisome and and uh this has to do with pattern recognition putting together pieces of information that are fragmented in the landscape there's this observation um, that um, uh, has been made that there are uh, migratory white blood cells in your body that will call for, for simplicity, we'll call them macrophage, okay. um, that move around in your body and control, you know, there's dendritic cells, a whole bunch of different flavors of these things, as yep. you know, um, but we'll just call them macrophages and, uh, or monocytes. And there is a subpopulation of these that you can pull out of people's bodies and you can analyze them in flow cytometry, cool tech, um, that continue to uh, um, carry spike protein for a very long period of time, months. And they have markers on their surface by flow cytometry that are consistent with an unusual activated hyperinflammatory state. Okay, so you have migratory white blood cells post-vaccination in your body, which continue to maintain spike protein. So they have it on their surface. Is that because and they're- in their, And in their cytoplasm, in most, cytoplasm, most are they, are they Are they and, displaying and actually, it? Spike, no, well, they may or may, I don't think they display them. I think what we're talking about is cytoplasmic and intranuclear spike, it turns out, when it's cytoplasmic, can be translocated across the nuclear membrane yeah. and has other effects on key um, metabolic pathways and uh, uh, gene regulatory pathways in the nucleus of these monocytes that have been so um, altered some way. And the problem is how, how to comprehend that because um, monocytes typically aren't readily transfected in these systems. And they are certainly not infected. That's been one of the paradoxes in thinking about antibody dependent cellular side, I'm sorry, about antibody dependent enhancement. Um, when we talk about that yeah. process like dengue, dengue blows open monocytes that uh, because of antibody coding that allows them to uh, use the FC receptor and get infected. That does not happen with this virus. Why are we getting spike protein in a long-lived fashion in these monocytes? They could be taking it up from the environment, but then we would see the same phenotype with the natural infection. Maybe we would see it more with the vaccine because you got more spike, but it's a conundrum. 
Here's the theoretical possibility that goes back to your metaphor of the fiberglass log. Okay. Okay. If these RNAs are present in the cytoplasm of these cells that will be targeted, yeah. well, the way that they usually get targeted is they, they're triggered to undergo a self-destructive sequence. You know, it's as if uh, Captain Kirk says, hit the auto-destruct button. Well, that auto-destruct button for the Enterprise triggers something called apoptosis, apoptosis as you know. Apoptosis, yeah. Um, and uh, so apoptosis happens and in the nucleus fragments yep. and uh, the cell fragments into vesicles largely. Yep. These little packages that have GORP from inside the cell inside of them. Okay, they're kind of like liposomes. Yep. It's kind of like the cell blows up and releases a whole bunch of different liposomes that have inside of it whatever was in the cell before. Yep. Okay, and what happens to those liposomes? Other cell types, mononuclear cells, yep. phagocytes, macrophage, come in and they clean up all that debris, all that blown up uh, enterprise. Yep. Um, and uh, if those fiberglass logs, so this is totally hypothetical. Yeah. If those fiberglass logs have no ready enzymatic way to be turned into a uh, forest litter. Yep. Um, they will still be there sitting in those vesicles. Absolutely. And if those vesicles are taken up by monocytes and processed, then there's a good chance that those fiberglass logs are going to be just because we know this with fiberglass. It's a great metaphor. Um, you know, it's like talking about uh, um, any of these uh, fibrous molecules. Uh, they, they will break free and potentially could then have a secondary transfection, a secondary yeah, delivery of it. that RNA into whole new cell types that are phagocytic cell types. Phagocytic cell types and... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but to the extent that we understand anything about the vaccine injured, monocytes are very frequently implicated, right? They have diseases that affect the functioning of this very important cell type involved in effectively garbage collection throughout the body all the time. Yeah, so the vaccine injured, if we're going to open that can of worms just a little bit, one of the things that has been fascinating uh, you recall back in the day, we had this conversation and we were both being so careful because we didn't get want to have what happened to us that has subsequently happened. So uh, there's a great example of we self-censored um, and it didn't do us any good. Right. <laughs> <laughs>